Hello, this is Jerry Morton. Welcome to my Finding My Way podcast. This is podcast number 39, titled Misunderstandings. Podcasts 34 through 61 are stories from the year of Army training I experienced. The training started in August 1966 and ended in June 1967. The stories are published in the book Reluctant Lieutenant from Basic to OCS in the 60s, which was published by Texas A&M University Press as a military history. Misunderstandings is an account of various misunderstandings Jerry encountered during basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey in the fall of 1966. Among other things, the misunderstandings led to a barracks fistfight, consistent rule breaking, and the consequences of breaking the chain of command. Misunderstandings A pattern was beginning to evolve. We automatically woke up in the morning before the sergeants turned on the lights. Most of us were able to finish our morning chores before we were ordered to rush downstairs and through the glass doorway. We would straggle down and stand at our spot in the dark, cold morning air minutes before the sergeants began yelling. On one such morning, a hundred or so of the guys and I were awaiting the arrival of the rest of the company. The morning runs... In the pre-dawn hours were no longer a strain for me. They were just something that had to be endured. Well, that is not exactly true. I was beginning to enjoy feeling fit and strong. I had scored 360 points on the last PT test. I knew I would be able to pass the PT exam at the end of basic without a problem. My palms, however, still seeped fluid from the damage done to them by the monkey bars. It was just one of those things. The same was true for my big toenail. It was dead. The black, congealed blood bruise beneath it still throbbed. Pus came out from around its edges. Overall, it was just one more endurable thing. I would be glad when it finally fell off. What was irritating was my inability to stop coughing. Other than those few inconveniences, I was feeling pretty good. Suddenly, a hush fell over the group. Several guys were looking up. I instinctively looked up as well. High in the night sky and directly overhead was a rapidly expanding whitish ring of light that left a glowing mist in its inner circle. In less than an eye blink, it expanded to cover a huge area of sky while changing color to a glowing purple. The stars shone through the purple veil like bangles on a prom dress. Then the color began to fade. It was like a A giant skyrocket, suddenly bursting forth with its beautiful colors at a 4th of July celebration. But there was absolutely no sound, only silence in this unearthly purple color bathing the night sky. A hushed voice broke through the silence. Do you think... It was a nuclear explosion. Murmurs and nervous laughter followed the statement. We're all dead, someone said. I felt at a slight loss. If it were an attack, should I not be diving for cover? Standing there in the middle of the parade ground did not seem to me a good thing to be doing in the middle of an attack. That was stupid. 
it, if it really was an attack, I thought then it was an air attack. There was nothing for an infantryman to do. Time enough for the infantry in due course. No, this was something else that had a logical explanation. I did not know what it was. Maybe I never would. The army does not tell you everything. The beauty of it caused me to reflect. To my way of thinking, this was one of those once-in-a-lifetime moments. I was glad the army had me out in the wee hours of the morning to witness it. A few days later, some guy said he had read a newspaper report about the light in the sky. There was some kind of upper atmosphere testing taking place. Gas was released from a rocket to measure something or other in the stratosphere. The government had not told anyone about the tests in advance because no one thought anyone would be up that early in the morning to see it, the guy stated. That explanation seemed a little weak. Something was wrong with it. Nothing else was ever mentioned about it as far as I know. Besides, I had sergeants filling my day and not much time for anything else. My one connection with the civilian world was writing my evening letters to my wife and reading her daily ones. It was hard to find the time to write, though. Sometimes I would write them in the dark, lying in my bunk with the street lights outside providing the only illumination. They were important to her. Hers were important to me. I had been able to call her once or twice. There was just the one pay phone and 250 men. Standing in line to use it took so long. Then, when it was finally your turn, you could feel the pressure of all the others waiting to use it. Nothing very intimate could be said. So much had happened. How could you explain it over the phone in a couple of hurried minutes? You could not. We stayed with our letters. Various subgroups were forming among the men. The college graduates tended to gravitate together, as did the recent high school graduates. Then there were the hard-working, hard-living blue-collar types. Of course, each of these groups had their own subgroups. Some of the guys from college were obnoxious. They had an air of superiority about them that was just plain irritating. No matter how they interacted with the others, they sent out subtle and not so subtle messages that they knew they were better than almost everyone else. Word ran through the company that one of the college guys, a fellow named Gary, had pushed one of the working men's buttons once too often. Mike was one of those heavily muscled types who obviously had not done well in grammar when he was in school. He had a thick New Jersey accent, and his speech was riddled with tense errors and double negatives. It was plain he was no scholar. He was, however, a leader in his own circle of hard-working friends. I had found him to be friendly enough. It was true that he had a habit of cutting into the chow line. He and his friends had the ability to zoom in on someone who would be intimidated enough by them to not protest their stepping into the line in front of them. Sometimes they jumped in front of a friend, but mostly they barged in front of someone they sensed would be too afraid to tell them no. There were always guys who grumbled about it. Their protest had no effects at the time. I had seen it before at the various public schools I attended. Fortunately, Mike and his crew never pressed me. They did not cut in front of me. There were others that they did not challenge as well. 
You did not want to put yourself in a compromising situation with Mike. He respected that. From time to time, we would get paired up for some training activity. Mike and I got along when that happened. He had his own integrity and his own way of living. That is how it is when different cultures come together. As long as you did not press them, they did not press you. Gary, in his apparent arrogance, did not understand these subtleties. Mike was damn mad about something Gary had done or said. He was going to fight Gary that night. Hawk and a couple of the others asked me what I thought about it. I said I thought Gary would get his clock thoroughly cleaned. He probably deserved it. The fight ought to happen. Once it took place, they could work it out in a subtle piece that would require few words. Let it happen was my opinion. Gary needed to learn. So it was decided that we would not try to stop it. After chow that night, a crowd began gathering in our platoon bay. Neither Gary nor Mike was in our platoon. Nonetheless, the fight was to be here. Bunks and chairs were moved to clear out enough space. This was a big deal. I had not realized that so many people were aware of the fight or were interested in its outcome. A number of the college guys were hovering around Gary. Their conversations were hushed. He did not have many close friends. It was interesting that some of his critics were now there with him. This had the makings of a real confrontation between people living on opposite sides of the tracks. I had not thought that it would evolve in just this way. The press of people in the space and the cigarette smoke in the harsh, overhead barracks lighting created a 1930s atmosphere of a backroom beer hall. It fit the moment. The semi-professional fighters would complete the scene. A wave of new faces pushed into the large bay area. It was Mike's vanguard. This was the first time I had looked at them as a group. God, they were tough. If that group had rushed the college guys, they would have beaten them to a pulp. These college boys were in over their heads. They were staring into the eyes of hardened street fighters. Luck was sitting on the shoulders of the college guys simply because of the restraint shown by their confronters. They had just a glint of understanding in their eyes, as was reflected in the wide-eyed stares they gave the street guys. At that moment, I think they were suddenly glad they were not in Gary's shoes. The tough guys could have ended it right there and then. If they had feigned a charge, Gary's worried trainers would have pooped in their pants. The street guys were the kings of the ring. The group parted and Mike strode forward and stood tall like the champion he was. His supporters hollered catcalls at Gary, tormenting him with their shouts. Bets were being made. As Mike moved into the open space in the center of the bay, Gary emerged from his corner as the college guys around him pulled back from him. He had not moved. The noise and tension were equally high. The two antagonist eyes met. Gary was still wearing his fatigue shirt. Mike was stripped down to his t-shirt. His powerful arms 
and shoulder muscles rippled with tension. Gary turned his lean frame to the side and began removing his college graduation ring from his finger in a slow and methodical manner, his shoulders sloping in sadness or fear. It was hard to know which was the case. Pow! Mike stepped forward and sucker punched Gary on the side of his jaw. The crack of knuckle on chin bone was so loud and sudden it stopped all talk. Gary's ring flew across the room, making a loud smacking sound as it struck the far wall. Gary crumpled to the floor like a dropped rag. He was out cold. The college guys murmured. All eyes turned to the crumpled form on the floor except mine. Mike hesitated for just a second and then stepped forward, pulling his foot back to deliver a powerful kick to the pile of flesh. Knowing what was about to happen, I sprang in front of Gary's still form without thinking. Confronting Mike in a deep crouch, ready to spring at him, I hissed through my teeth. You've beaten him, Mike. You've won. There's nothing more to prove. You've done it. He paused in mid-kick. Lowering his foot, he looked at me. His muscles were tense. My mind started to race. God Almighty, I thought. He is so much stronger than I am. He could do me great harm. If we start fighting, I must avoid thinking. If I think, I will surely freeze up. This has to be spontaneous and violent. My legs were too far apart to give me solid balance. My arms were far from my body, too far to throw a hard punch. I did not have a good platform of attack, and I could not move. If he kept coming, it would be all over for me. I did not m dare, I did not dare move unless he came at me. Any movement on my part could be perceived as attack. I was stuck in that awkward position. Our eyes locked. I knew it was going to be bad. His supporters were beginning to mutter. Other than that, the room remained silent. It seemed like minutes. It was only a few seconds. You've won, Mike. You've made your point. It's over. I said in a less tense voice without relaxing my stance. Mike stepped back. His crowd cheered. They swarmed around him, clapping him on the back and messing at his hair. Out the door and down the hall, the jubilant crowd moved en masse as they celebrated their victory. Several guys were helping Gary to his feet. He was groggy. My heart suddenly went out to him. He had been doing the noble and fair thing by removing his ring from his finger. Having that ring on his fist would have been given him an, an unfair advantage. It would have been a natural brass knuckle. Gary had thought he was going to be in a boxing match of some kind governed by neat rules and the like. He had just encountered the hard realities of street fighting. It was dangerous stuff. Gary was lucky. The college guys were just beginning to understand how lucky Gary was and to realize their own precarious position in the scheme of things. No one said anything to me concerning my actions. I went to my bunk and started spit-shining my shoes. After that night, I was kinder to Gary. He seemed to be less of an ass. Actually, he ended up being an okay guy. Meanwhile, Mike and his crew did not cut into line whenever I was around after that. There was never any repercussions from the incident, I did not trust him, but we got along okay and cooperated on a friendly enough level whenever fate brought us together. The promised Sunday visitor's day the first sergeant had told us about was just about to happen. I was looking forward to the time off. I would go to the PX and get some floor wax, shoe polish, and other items. Then I would write Anna some long letters. 
One of the guys in the platoon asked me if anyone was coming to visit me. When I told him that my wife was too far away, he expressed regret and asked how I dealt with the loneliness. I told him it was not so bad. I was busy. There was little time to be lonely. He refused to let the matter rest. He said his wife was bringing a picnic basket. They lived just a few miles from post. The two of them had grown up together. The separation was hard for them. A day or two later, he told me that he and his wife wanted me to join them on their picnic. Such an offer was a great honor. It would be an insult to turn them down. I tried to be gracious in accepting the offer, even though I did not understand why they were going out of their way like this. If it had been Anna and me, we would have wanted to be by ourselves. This was truly a great kindness these people were extending to me. The wife was very pleasant. Her fried chicken was good. They wanted to know how the army had snared me, so I told my story. He said he was in the army by mistake. Bleeding hemorrhoids had been plaguing him for years. They had gotten so bad during the previous year that his wife used cotton swabs to soak up the blood from them when he came home at night. The army should have rejected him at the induction center, he said, but someone messed up. They had written his congressman and included a doctor's letter saying he was unfit for military service. He expected to be released from the army soon. As it was, the seat of his army issue boxer shorts was wet with blood by noon every day. She had baked a great apple pie. It was clear that they loved each other and were glad for his hemorrhoids. Their hemorrhoid story brought to mind my day at the Army Induction Center the previous May in Cincinnati. It was just about five months ago, but it seemed like a lifetime. We had been rushed into a large room with hooks on the walls and instructions to strip down to our underpants. Hanging our clothes on the hooks and turning in our valuables to be retrieved later, sergeants were hustling us along. One guy among the several hundred in my group was wearing ladies' underwear. As he took off his pants, several of the men began whooping and hollering in delight. Two sergeants rushed past me, one of them was saying that he would take care of the son of a bitching draft dodger. They grabbed the guy by the arms and hustled him out of the room. That was the last we saw of him. We were lined up in three long rows. A physician told us to turn around and then instructed those of us in the first row to drop our underwear to our ankles, bend over, and spread our cheeks. We did as we were told. He and a couple of other assistants quickly walked down the line looking at our anuses. It must have been quite a sight. They were checking for hemorrhoids. Apparently we all passed. After walking past all three lines of exposed buttholes, the doctor told us to turn around and face back to the front. Next, he announced that he was going to check for hernias. He told us that when he stood in front of us, we were to turn our heads to the left. He would insert his finger into the man's right scrotum. We would be told when to cough. The process would then be repeated for the left side. Turning our heads to the left, we would cough when he told us to do so. Quickly, he moved down the line. The coughs becoming louder as he came closer. Suddenly, he stood up and shouted in the face of one man as he spoke to us all, 
Damn it! You turn your face when you cough. Do you think I want 5,000 men coughing in my face all day long, showering with their shitty germs? He stared into the eyes of the man in front of him and snapped, Now turn your damn head! After a short pause by the man's scrotum, which caused the guy to make a brief and voluntary sound of pain, the physician shouted out loudly, Cough! The man did. The physician moved on. I remembered to turn my head when he stopped in front of me. At the end of the day, a sergeant said we would be notified by mail as to our draft status. My notice stated that I was 1A. It came as a shock. I did not know then that it was the beginning of my Army experience. But the fear had already started to creep in. There was reason to suspect that my picnic companion's story was true. The physician at the induction center could easily have overlooked his hemorrhoids. Then again, they might not have been bad enough to give him a medical exemption. Since I did not need to make a decision one way or the other on the matter, I simply agreed with him. He would probably be dismissed from the Army. I was sorry that he endured so much at the moment. Fortunately, there was time that afternoon to get the floor wax and other items. Floor wax was forbidden, of course. It had been explained to us that we were not to spend our time or money on floor wax, spit shining our shoes, or engaging in any other unusual cleaning activities beyond what was necessary to maintain normal neatness. We quickly learned that those people who did use floor wax spit shined their shoes and took other extreme measures to clean their areas got the highest marks during inspections. Those with the highest ratings were then granted special privileges. To be more accurate, they were less hassled, did fewer punitive push-ups, and were not ordered to redo their cleaning details. The vast majority of us were not stupid, We did what was necessary. Every so often, someone's hiding spot would be discovered and the guy would have to do extra push-ups for having floor wax. One guy was ordered to use up all his floor wax while the rest of us looked on. Such inconveniences were regrettable but minor. The advantages for violating the rules far outweighed the consequences. Besides, the sergeants were careful not to look in specific areas for contraband during their inspections. We had a mutual conspiracy. Our week in the field arrived just as a cold front passed through. We were trucked a long way into the woods. Each of us had been issued half a pup tent, along with the necessary pins, poles, and rope a sleeping bag, and an air mattress for the occasion. I could not believe the luxury. All of my campouts with the Boy Scouts had been without an air mattress. It was hard sleeping. Only sissies, girls, and the rich slept on air mattresses. Here I was, going to war with an air mattress. This was luxury camping, and people were complaining. I liked it. Setting up a pup tent was duck soup. Camping out was play. I was good at it. So many of the guys lacked the basic skills necessary for cold weather camping. I was glad to help out whenever I could. It rained constantly for the first couple of days. Then at night it would stop and any standing water would freeze over. Army pouches are great rain gear. 
I had never had any rain gear like it. The hood pulled over your head and extended beyond your face. You could carry your rifle under it and keep it nicely protected. Even with your rifle and pack on underneath the poncho, there was enough of a spread that it allowed the rain to fall straight to the ground without getting your lower legs or feet wet. That is, as long as there was no wind and you were not marching. We were always marching. In the mornings, the concentric ice rings from the night's standing rain puddles would be the only mud-free item in view. During the day, it just got warm enough to melt the ice. We were miserable, cold, wet, and dirty. Early on the second night, Sergeant Soto informed us that the Army field jackets had arrived. They were piled up inside the large command tent. We were to go into the command tent in a single file and pick up a jacket. We were not to stop inside the tent. Once we were outside, we would try our jacket on. If it did not fit, we were to trade around until we found one that did. The once long-haired Louis was in front of me as we entered the command tent. Good old Louis had acquired a reputation as a ten percenter. Ten percent of the guys never got the word. They always managed to end up doing the wrong thing or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. No matter how many times you tell a group of soldiers something, 10% of them never get the word. The command tent was big. It was more like a small circus tent. Its sides hung straight down like walls and were about six feet high. The tent had a high sloping roof and there were portable heaters inside. Electric light bulbs powered by a gasoline generator hung from the center post. It was a welcome relief from the cold just to be inside it. Louis picked up a field jacket right in front of Sergeant Soto. Instead of following the man in front of him on out of the tent, Louis stepped to the side and began to put it on. Soto just stood there in disbelief. Not only did this guy disobey an order, he did it right in the face of the very man who had issued it. The expression on Soto's face held everyone except Louis in limbo. It was as if a group of mice suddenly saw the bold black eyes of a coiled rattlesnake inches from their faces. Louis was the lone exception. He was in a different world. As he finished putting his arms through the sleeves, he turned to Soto and said, Hey, fuck you, man. This thing's too small. Fuck me. Fuck you. Fuck me. Screamed Soto in a rage and disbelief. The intensity and immediacy of Soto's response managed to catch Louis' attention. For the briefest of moments, the world stood still. Louis looked at Soto. Soto looked at Louis. Then Louis broke the spell. In a brilliant display of intuitive intelligence, he leaped to the tense exit flap. Soto, standing with his fists clenched at his sides, turned to say something. With a great display of willpower, he turned back to the line and motioned for the next man to move on through. From that point on, our motto became, Fuck me, fuck you, fuck me. Wearing our ponchos as we sat in the training bleachers on those cold, wet days was a real blessing. You could sink your head deep into the hood so that your face was almost hidden. 
Then, by slightly tilting your head down, your breath became trapped inside the hood and seeped down your neck into your chest. The warmth was intoxicating. You could then gently close your eyes and drift off to sleep. Not until a few of the guys fell off the bleachers did the sergeants catch on that most of us were dozing during the lectures. Once they understood the situation, they quickly adjusted. Two or three sergeants were always hovering around trying to catch someone sleeping. Once they spotted a sleeper, they would charge through the seated mass to confront the evildoer. Of course, the commotion of the charge and the vibration of the plank-type seating was enough to wake even the hardest sleeper. By the time the sergeants reached their victim, he was wide awake and protesting that he had been falsely accused. It got to be a real game. I mastered the art of sleeping with my eyes partially open. It was a skill that kept me out of a lot of trouble. The principal difference between army training in the field and training back in the garrison complex appeared to be the camping out. We still did live firing at the rifle range. There were still gas attack drills. We still marched. Inspections never ceased. We had to clean our rifles and do cleanup details. Even the designated truck drivers continued to be awakened in the middle of the night and told to go drive trucks. I was learning to feel grateful that I had failed the driving portion of the truck driver's exam. It was funny how doing the wrong things is sometimes the right thing. There was a slight difference at the rifle range. They were having us fire at silhouettes instead of the traditional bullseye's target. A pop-up head and torso target would appear downrange. After you fired your designated rounds at it, they would pull it down into the trenches. Within a minute or so, it would reappear with little white circles drawn on it, showing you where you had hit it. The sergeant said to aim low, because if you aimed at the head and shot high, you would miss the target altogether. Hitting the ground in front of someone might still bring them down. The bullet would cause rocks and debris to fly up. Getting hit by a high-velocity piece of flying gravel was just as bad as being hit by a bullet. Most of us aimed for the heart. Some shot at the head. I was still having problems with my shot group. Two bullets would hit right where I wanted them, the third round would be an inch or two off. A new training activity was to have us all look across an open field at a tree line. We would be told that there were camouflaged soldiers out there. Our task was to find them. It was difficult. Guys would yell out that they could see someone over there by such and such a clump of something. Then a few other guys would say, Oh yeah, you're right. Before long, everyone was seeing something. At least that was what they said. Sometimes the sergeants during the instruction would yell at the camouflage guys to move. It was easier to spot them when they moved, but it was still not easy. All in all, everyone agreed that they would see the hidden soldiers when just about all of us were unable to see a thing. It made the sergeants feel good, and we got an early break. Honey bun trucks were our sweet rewards. It finally stopped raining in the middle of the week. Mud was everywhere, and on everything. Because the foxholes were full of water, we were instructed not to jump in them when we practiced one type of gas attack drill. Normally, we would approach a large foxhole at high port and in a trot. 
Meanwhile, a sergeant, conveniently seated on a folding chair, would shout, Gas! or Nerve Gas! In both cases, you were supposed to jump into the foxhole. If the cry was nerve gas, you would pull out your little piece of cloth and simulate pinching off bits of congealed nerve gas. The cry of gas prompted the gas mass drill. After completing your preventive measures, you would then lie on the edge of the foxhole with your rifle at the ready, waiting to repel the enemy. Since the bottom of the hole held about six inches of muddy water, Sergeant Boone said that we should stop at the edge of the foxhole and pretend that we had jumped into it as we went through the drill. My turn finally came. Sergeant Boone was beginning to realize that I enjoyed pushing his buttons just a little every once in a while. On long marches, I would hum under my breath ever, ever so slightly when he was near. He would cock his head and look into the ranks, never certain enough that someone was humming to call out a guy's name and confront him, but certain enough to make him listen just a little harder. He never asked anyone about the humming, and no one ever told Charging the foxhole at full speed with my best color scream in my throat, I anticipated Sergeant Boone's shout. It did not come until I was on the lip of the mud hole. Gas, he half whispered, instinctively reaching for my mask while suddenly realizing that I was going into the hole. I tried to stop. After putting my body through some near superhuman contortions, I paused on the edge tottering violently. At last, the momentum won. Both feet landed in the mud and burrowed into the ooze until they were deep enough that the cold, chocolate-covered water poured over the rim of my combat boots. The shock of the cold water on my feet and ankle took my breath away. Rising from his chair, Boone shook his head in disgust. Get out and stand on the rim, he ordered with just a hint of a smile. I did as ordered. Now jump in and shout, Gas! He said, I did. Do it again. I did. Keep it up until I tell you when to stop, he said, unable to hide the pleasure he was depriving from my situation. There I was, jumping in and out of a mud hole and shouting, Gas! as soldier after soldier ran up to the rim, received his gas and nerve gas alert, and practiced the appropriate drill. A few of us made eye contact during this display and exchanged smiles at the sheer stupidity of it all. I could not conceal my grin from Boone, nor could he hide his. After twenty minutes or so, he told me to stop and move out. The next morning, my cough was much worse. A couple of the guys insisted that I go ask Sergeant Boone for permission to go to sickbay. To my surprise, he agreed without protest. The supply truck took me to the main section of the post. I was instructed to catch it at three that afternoon for the trip back to the company bivouac site. If I missed it, I would have to wait there until someone decided to look for me. It was best to be sure I was there at three. Stick out your tongue, the white smock doctor ordered without displaying any sign of a bedside manner. Next he stuck one of those ear viewing things into my ear and peered inside. Don't you ever clean your ears? he asked gruffly. The guy did not look much older than I was. One thing was certain, though. He did not know much about what happened to soldiers in basic training. Between costs, I responded in self-defense. <coughs> they don't <coughs> give you time <coughs> to 
to do to do that or much of anything else. He got a big syringe and hosed out my ears. A lot of lumpy stuff came out. No doubt about it, I was able to hear much better. Like all good doctors, he wrote out a prescription. I was to take it to the hospital pharmacy. I glanced at the square piece of paper he handed me. It said I should take a couple of pills every so many hours for so many days. I had to walk about five miles to, to get to the hospital pharmacy. Still, it was easy duty as far as I was concerned. It was about one in the afternoon by the time I finally got my medicine. I had an hour or so to kill before going to the pickup point. The thought occurred to me to ask someone in the medical corps about my being eligible for a direct commission as a first lieutenant. There was a colonel who was a psychiatrist listed in the hospital directory on the wall next to the elevator. I figured he would most likely be knowledgeable about the rules for someone with a master's degree in psychology. Riding up on the elevator, I began to have second thoughts about what I was doing. Maybe I should go back and see the company first sergeant about it, since I had already asked him about it. He might get irritated that I had broken the chain of command. They had drilled us heavily on the proper use of the chain of command right from the start. If I wanted or needed anything, I was to go to my platoon sergeant. If he had problems assisting me, he would go to the senior drill instructor. The senior drill instructor would go to... This was where it started to get confusing to me. Did the senior drill instructor go to the first sergeant, or did he go to the company commander? In our case, that was Lieutenant Brown. Somewhere, the lieutenant gets asked, and if he cannot come up with a solution, then he asks a captain, who asks a major, who asks a lieutenant colonel, who asks a colonel who, jeez. Eventually, the president of these great United States of America will be asked your question. That is, of course, assuming it is a tough question. This is ridiculous. No one is going to care if I go outside the chain of command on this, I reasoned. Anyway, who will ever know? The elevator door opened and I got out. My heart was pounding. Something told me that I was going to find myself in a world of hurt over this. Reason be damned, a private does not casually walk into a colonel's office to have a little chat. Hell, this is my life. If I can get a direct commission, then I should not have to complete the rest of basic training, eight weeks of AIT, and six months of OCS. I have already done all of the push-ups that a person could have to do in one lifetime. I did not need to be in this world of hurt, I reasoned. Logic prevailed. Entering the reception area to the colonel's office, I walked up to the receptionist. Yes, she said, flashing me a bright smile. For the briefest of seconds, I wondered if she knew that I had clean ears. At that same moment, it dawned on me that my fatigues were damp, dirty, and had the smell of being in the field for several days. Since that was where they had come from, it was logical that they would communicate a consistent message. Unfortunately, I was the only one present who had just come from the field. Damn garrison soldiers always being pretty. They needed to be in the field where the action was. I laughed at myself. I was thinking like a combat infantryman. Before long, I would be acting like someone in the regular army, an RA, as opposed to the U.S. guys. Those guys who were drafted into the army 
and were only in for the mandatory two years were the U.S. guys. They just wanted to serve their time and get out. That was me. Sure, the Army had me listed as RA because I had technically volunteered to join. I had volunteered to go to infantry OCS, the Army said. I was RA. No, I was U.S. I did not want to be in the Army. If there had been no draft, I would not be here. I was U.S. The receptionist delicately cleared her throat and asked, May I help you, soldier? I'd like to see the colonel, please, came my response. I'm sorry. He's out for the day, the Ipana toothpaste girl pleasantly replied. Bad day at Black Rock, I thought. The phrase was the title of one of my favorite movies. Spencer Tracy starred in it. The one-armed combat veteran rides a train into this dusty town. Anyway, things just do not go right for Spencer or me. No matter what he did, it only seemed to get worse. As in all heroic movies... Spencer was forced to fight the bad guys and make things right. I dutifully thanked the young lady and left to take the elevator to the ground floor. When the door opened, I found myself staring the first sergeant in the face. I was stunned. My jaw dropped. He took a step toward me as I stepped back. My thin mustache first sergeant, the nice grandfatherly guy, had found me breaking the chain of command. What floor, soldier? He asked in that brisk manner of his. It's okay, came my reply. I stepped inside. What floor? He asked again, reaching to push a number as the door closed behind us. I'm in Charlie Company's first platoon, first sergeant, I said. Yes, he said, first looking at the ceiling and then at me. Are you ill? Remembering to call first, I replied, (coughs) Yes, first sergeant. Aren't you a little far from the sick bay, he inquired, his voice sounding bored. Well, they sent me here to get some medicine, and then I went to this colonel's office to see if I qualified for a direct commission in the medical corps, but he wasn't in. I'm supposed to catch the truck back to the field at three, I blurted out. Guilt sometimes makes you do foolish things. In a wonderfully supportive tone, he said, Third platoon, yes, Will. I hope you get better, son. The elevator door opened. He nodded and left. Worry hovered over my head as the truck took me back to the bivouac site. Anyway, I thought, the first sergeant really was not interested in me. He was kind of bored, and when he had ended the conversation, he was so pleasant. Everything was going to be okay. It was chow time. The Army's hot chow in the field is excellent. It smells good, tastes good, and is good, in my opinion. I felt better after I had eaten. As usual, the next morning we were called to attention in front of our pup tents to hear the orders of the day. Sergeant Boone walked right up to my face. You broke the chain of command, he said through clenched teeth, his eyes squinting. I was stunned. I had been found out. Yes, Sergeant, I replied crisply. I looked straight ahead at nothing and unfocused my eyes. This was no time to be eyeballing. Spitting words into my face, he said, Get your entrenching tool. Go over by 1st Platoon's area and start helping them dig a field latrine. He pointed in the general direction he wanted me to go. Yes, Sergeant, I replied with a sharp military about face. I turned 
to the tent and pulled out my army shovel. Boone had walked away. This was not fair. This was the army. Hawk asked me what was up. I told him that I had screwed up at the hospital. But not to worry. They were making no big deal about it. He was genuinely concerned, which warmed my heart. Joining the six or seven guys already in the large, half-dug pit, I unfolded my entrenching tool. Some excellent engineering went into the entrenching tool's design. It was issued to us folded up in a neat pouch that could be hung from your web belt. When you took it out of the pouch, it was compactly packaged. The blade folded back on the handle so as not to take up a lot of space. Folded over in that way, it was about two feet long. Backing off a screw at the base of the shovel, the blade unfolded easily. To secure the blade into position was a simple process. You simply re-screwed the screw on the handle. An added advantage to the tool was a stabilizing bar that protruded from the base of the shovel. If you did not fully extend the shovel blade to the open position, but left it at a 90 degree angle to the handle, the stabilizing bar became a pick. When the shovel blade was fully extended, the pick-like stabilization bar rested neatly against the wooden handle, providing a solid tool. It was shaped to form around the handle and served as a brace for the shovel's head. Back at the barracks, we used our entrenching tools a lot. We were always losing the keys to the padlocks on our wall and foot lockers. The pick end of the entrenching tool efficiently broke the lock. However, it took two entrenching tools to get the job done. One would be rigged to be a pick, and the other was used as a hammer. Setting the end of the pick extension underneath the shining loop of the lock and on the base of the square locking mechanism while holding it steady was the tricky part. Once that was accomplished, your partner smashed his entrenching tool down onto the pointed end of the shovel blade. The lock busted open. The force of the impact broke the little tip of the round metal loop inserted into the lock. You did not have to smash the entire lock. The TV commercials that showed a lock getting shot and still staying locked were misleading. The strength of the lock was on the inside, not in the outer casing. We were all very familiar with our entrenching tool. Up to this point, I had never used it as a shovel. Everyone was too busy to have us spend a lot of time digging foxholes whenever we played war games. As a basic shovel, the entrenching tool fell short. Digging with it is a real pain. It hurts your back because you never get to stand up fully when you are using it. My comrades in shovel never revealed why they had been selected to serve on this digging at detail. We just accepted one another. No questions were asked. The hole was knee-deep, about 30 feet long, and maybe 6 feet wide. It could handle a lot of behinds at one time. Imagining all of those bare bottoms lined up around the perimeter struck me as particularly funny. I began sharing my vision with our crew. Before long, we had come up with a whole string of one-liners and fantasy situations that kept us laughing. Curious onlookers began coming by to find out what was so funny. The morning passed pleasantly enough, although I wound up with several blisters on my hands. No problem. Those monkey bars would make quick work of them. At lunchtime, Sergeant Boone came over to the trench. We stopped laughing and talking as he approached. 
You always stayed on task when a sergeant was around. He surveyed the scene for a few moments without comment. We had moved a lot of earth. Happy hearts make hard work easy, or something like that was said or should have been said by Confucius. Boone called me out of the trench. He said I had dug enough and told me to rejoin the platoon and eat some lunch. When I got back, I found the platoon cleaning weapons. They had already eaten and were getting ready to have them inspected. Hell, I had not cleaned mine in two days. We had fired them on the range three days ago. Yesterday was sick day, and today was ditch day. Usually, I clean my weapon as soon as possible after firing it because they were always pulling surprise weapons inspections. It just had not worked out for me this time. If your rifle did not meet the sergeant's approval, you caught hell. Push-ups, a shit detail or two, and verbal abuse were the standard consequences for having a dirty weapon. I was hungry. After considering my options, I decided to go and wolf down some of the leftover food the field kitchen crew was in the process of scraping into an open pit. After I'd gotten down about four swallows, I heard Sergeant Boone call for the platoon to form up for a rifle inspection. This was really bad. Once you started sliding downhill, you just couldn't stop. No telling what Boone would do to me when he looked down my rifle barrel. Oh, how I wanted all of this to go away. I felt sick at my stomach. Sergeant Boone snatched the rifle out of the hands of the guy standing next to me and inspected it in great detail. He spun the barrel in uh, down so that the wooden stock was in his face. It was a masterful move. Efficient in motion and very military. Boone knew his stuff. You had to give him credit for that. He pried open the butt plate at the end of the stock and squinted as he looked for dirt in the hinges, spinning the rifle back to its proper position. With made-for-TV precision, he inserted his thumb into the breech and lowered the rifle so that he could look directly down the barrel. Returning the rifle to port arms, he thrust it back at the private standing beside me. Not a word was spoken. Boone sidestepped to the front of me and snatched the weapon from my hands with real force. One second it was in my hands and then it was his. A blink of an eye would have concealed the exchange. This was serious. He spun the rifle to present the butt plate to him as eye level. Not once did he remove his steely stare from my eyes. I was caught. Looking into his eyes, I was determined not to reveal any emotion. He closed the butt plate without breaking his hold on me with those cold eyes. The weapon spun to its rightful position he lowered the barrel and looked down the muzzle, efficiently returning it to port arms and locking his gaze on mine. He firmly but carefully thrust the weapon into my chest. I held it. He spoke clearly and loudly. Good job, soldier. That's the cleanest barrel I've seen in several days. All the while, he held my eyes in his emotionless gaze. Abruptly, he turned to confront the next man. After we had all been inspected and dismissed, Hawk came up to congratulate me. He said that Boone had not given anyone a positive comment for several days. I told him that the weapon was dirty. He did not believe me until he looked down the barrel himself. We agreed. 
Boone had told me that I had taken my medicine and that all was right with the world.